It was well known at Linbury Court School that whenever there was a red herring to be trailed or a wrong conclusion to be drawn, Jennings was the right person for the job. Mr Wilkins' weekend leave was a case in point. If only Jennings had taken the trouble to inquire, he would have discovered that although Mr Wilkins was certainly leaving on Friday, he would be returning in time for school on Monday morning. But Jennings did not inquire. From the fragment of conversation he had overheard in Matron's dispensary, he assumed that Mr Wilkins was leaving Linbury Court forever. Without delay, he rushed to the common room to broadcast the news of the master's resignation. I say, have you chaps heard? Stop press, news bulletin, he announced to the crowd as he hurtled through the door with the force of a rugger forward breaking loose from the scrum. Mr Wilkins is leaving. There followed a few seconds of stupefied silence while the tidings sank in. Then there arose a babble of disbelief. Hold Wilkie leaving? Don't be so stark raving cuckoo, Jennings. You're pulling our legs. Jennings stood his ground. If you don't believe me, you can jolly well ask Matron. I even heard him tell her which train he was going on. They believed him then. First because his tone was so earnest, and secondly because startling rumour is always more exciting than sober truth. Besides, if Matron knew all about it, it must be true. At first, the news was received with unrestrained joy. Hooray! Wacko! Yippee! Sounds of rejoicing could be heard all over the room. No more math tests on Fridays, cried Atkinson, cavorting round the common room table in an improvised war dance. By bedtime, their mood had changed. Mr Wilkins had his faults, that was agreed. But who could tell whether the new master who would come to take his place might not be even more difficult to get on with? I'm jolly sorry he's leaving, Venables remarked as he undressed that evening. I always liked him, really. You said this afternoon you were glad, Derbyshire reminded him. Oh, yes. But that was before I remembered that the new character might be a wizard sight worse. It was then that Jennings had a bright idea. I reckon we ought to buy old Wilkie a little present, just to show him how sorry we are that he's going, he suggested. The bright idea was taken up with enthusiasm. I'll subscribe sixpence, Venables offered. I've got an unused stamp you can have, volunteered Atkinson. If my postal order comes this week, I'll fork out ninepence, said Bromwich generously. Within a few minutes, it had become obvious that the Mr Wilkins Farewell Gift Fund would have to be organised on a proper footing. So Jennings and Derbyshire were appointed to collect the contributions and decide upon a suitable present. Furthermore, all the boys agreed to spread a little sunshine across the shadow of the master's departure by being on their very best behaviour. Let's all be decent to him during his last few days here, Jennings urged. How can we be more decent to him than we are already? Atkinson wanted to know. Oh, lots of ways. Open the door for him when he goes out of the room. I always do that anyway. Well, open it wider then. And laugh whenever he cracks a joke. I always do that too. Well, laugh louder then. I know old Wilkie's jokes are a bit chronic, but the least we can do is pretend they're funny. When Mr Wilkins reached Dormitory 6 that evening, he was surprised by the warmth of the reception that awaited him. Quickly now, Jennings, he ordered. I'm tired of standing about in drafty dormitories waiting for you stragglers to get into bed. Derbyshire gave him a look of tender sympathy. You're tired, sir. Would you like to sit down, sir? You can sit on my bed if you like, sir, he offered. No, sit on mine, sir, begged Temple. My mattress isn't so lumpy as old Derbyshire's. Mr Wilkins was puzzled. This concern for his comfort was unusual, to say the least. And his bewilderment increased when Jennings skipped across to the window and tugged on the cord that raised the sash. What on earth are you doing, boy? The master demanded. Closing the window, sir. You said it was drafty in the dormitory, sir. You might catch a cold if you stay in a draught, sir. I, um... Uh, <coughs> go back to bed at once, you silly little boy. Never mind about my catching cold. If you aren't in bed in two seconds from now, Jennings, you'll catch it hot. It was not intended to be a humorous remark, but so great was their desire to please that the boys seized upon this so-called gem of wit and savoured it to the full. Oh, sir! I say, you chaps, did you hear that? exclaimed Jennings in delight. Mr Wilkins has made a joke. Don't catch cold or you'll catch it hot. Ah, oh, mm, jolly witty answer, sir. I wish I could think of things like that. Waves of exaggerated laughter billowed round the room as the boys sat in bed, rocking with counterfeited glee. Ha, 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 roared Bromwich, his eyes swimming with bogus tears of mirth. Oh, it's a supersonic joke, sir. You ought to be on television, sir. Yes, rather, agreed Temple between gasps of hilarity. You can catch cold, but you can't catch hot. <laughs> Silence, thundered Mr Wilkins. 
and immediately the laughter stalled in mid-burst. Stop that silly noise, all of you. Mr. Wilkins felt vaguely uneasy as he put out the dormitory light and went downstairs to the staff room. Here he found Mr. Carter, in whom he confided his worries. I say, Carter, dormitory six have gone stark raving mad. I made a rather feeble joke and they all roared their heads off as though it was the funniest thing they'd ever heard. Oh, really? What did you say? Mr. Wilkins hesitated. He felt rather diffident about repeating his modest quip in cold blood. Oh, nothing really. I just told Jennings that whether or not I caught cold, he would catch it hot if he didn't get a move on. Mr. Carter waited, expecting more. Well, go on. What was the joke? he asked. Well, uh, that was it. That's what I said. <laughs> Mr. Wilkins explained with a self-conscious laugh. For a moment, his colleague looked blank. Then, in tones of mock admiration, he said, Oh, I see. Yes, of course. Very witty of you, Wilkins. In fact, I wonder you don't appear on... All right, all right. I told you it wasn't all that funny, Mr. Wilkins protested. But all this concern for my welfare sounds like a leg pull. And if I have any more disgraceful exhibitions of, well, of extremely courteous conduct, I shall... Oh, well, they'd better look out. It was not until break the next morning that a definite decision was reached about the farewell gift. Then Jennings rushed up to Derbyshire as he was drinking his mid-morning milk and slapped him on the back in triumph. Listen, Derby, I've had a supersonic brainwave about that present for Sir. It came to me suddenly during arithmetic. How about a clock? Oh, golly, yes. Just the job, Derbyshire agreed, his eyes lighting up behind his milk-splashed spectacles. I expect they've got some decent ones at that shop in the village, Jennings went on. So if I get permission to go into Limbury and buy it next Wednesday, we could show it to all the chaps first and then dole it out to old Wilkie when he takes us for English on Thursday afternoon. It'll be his very last lesson with us before he leaves. Oh, righto then. And somebody ought to make a speech to go with it, Derbyshire suggested. You can't just bung it over and say, here you are. Bags, you make the speech then. Who? Me? Oh, fish hooks, I shouldn't know what to say, Derbyshire demurred. Oh, that doesn't matter. No one will be listening anyway. Just stand up and waffle like the old geezers who dole out the prizes on speech day. Shortly before afternoon school on Thursday, Jennings marched into classroom three holding an alarm clock proudly before him, as though bearing an historical emblem in a royal procession. A few of the boys who had not yet seen the farewell gift came crowding round to make sure that their money had been well spent. And they were more than satisfied. And when they heard the nerve-shattering, ear-splitting, shrilling of the alarm bell, they plugged their ears with their fingers and leapt up and down in ecstasies of delight. Wacko! Oh, isn't it super? It goes on for ever so long if you let it, Jennings explained, switching off the alarm and setting it again at random. I vote we put it in the cupboard till the end of the lesson. Then we'll dish it out while old Darby gets cracking on his famous speech. Derbyshire looked up from a sheaf of notes on his desk. That's right, he said. I've learnt it all off by heart. Would you like to hear how it goes? No, I wouldn't, said Jennings shortly, as he slipped the clock into the cupboard and closed the door with a slam. Oh, well, I'll tell you then, Derbyshire went on unabashed. As soon as the lesson's over, I'm going to stand up and say, <clears throat> Mr Wilkins and gentlemen, unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, it gives me very great pleasure to be very happy to come here this afternoon, which reminds me of the story... Shh! Look out! He's coming! hissed Temple, who was keeping watch at the classroom door. The boys scurried to their desks, pleased and proud at the thought of all the pleasure which their generous gift would soon be bringing to Mr Wilkins. The only sound in the room now came from Derbyshire, practising his speech for the last time in a voiceless whisper. Mr Wilkins and gentlemen, unaccustomed as I am. The door swung open. L.P. Wilkins, Esquire, M.A. Cantab, had arrived for what was generally believed to be his last lesson with Form 3. The master was slightly taken aback by the unusual silence. He was aware, too, that the atmosphere was tense and expectant. Obviously, something was afoot. Mr Wilkins frowned. Just let them try any funny business, he thought to himself. Just let them try, that's all. His disapproving stare swivelled round and came to rest upon Derbyshire. Oh, what were you saying just then when I came in? He demanded. Derbyshire gave him a disarming smile. I was just saying, <coughs> unaccustomed as I was, sir. Unaccustomed as you were to what? Oh, nothing really, sir. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Derbyshire smiled again. It would not do to reveal the secret before the proper moment arrived. Mr Wilkins would know soon enough. 
Bristling with suspicion, Mr. Wilkins strode to the master's desk and opened a copy of Tennyson's In Memoriam. Now, first of all, I'm going to read you some verses by Alfred Lord Tennyson, and then I'm going to ask you some questions about them, he announced. So all sit up straight and keep your wits about you. He cleared his throat gustily and spoke in the special dramatic tones which he always used when reading poetry aloud to the form. <coughs> Ring out wild bells by Alfred Lord Tennyson. <coughs> Ring out wild bells to the wild sky, the flying cloud, the frosty light. The year is dying in the night. Ring out wild bells. And Temple put up his hand. Put your hand down, boy. I will not be interrupted while I'm reading, barked Mr Wilkins. Sorry, sir. I only wondered whether you meant we should have to write the questions in our books, sir. Of course you'll write them in your books. You don't imagine I want them carved on a marble slab, do you? No, no more silly interruptions. <coughs> Ring out wild bells to the wild sky, the flying cloud, the frosty light, the year... A shattering burst of coughing like a fusillade of machine gun fire drowned his next words. Venables, the unintentional culprit, hastened to express his deep regrets. Sorry, sir. It's my cough, sir. Matron's very kindly giving me some medicine for it, sir. But all right, all right. Only keep quiet while I'm reciting. He started again. <clears throat> Ring out wild bells to the wild sky. There came a knocking at the door. Mr. Wilkins paused and then decided to ignore the interruption. Ring out wild bells to the... W the knocking was repeated, louder this time, as though the visitor had brought a steam hammer with him to reinforce his efforts. Angry now, Mr. Wilkins abandoned his recital of the works of Alfred Lord Tennyson and shouted, Oh, come in, come in, for goodness sake. Don't stand out there beating on the panels like a... like a panel beater. Come in if you must. The door opened to admit Atkinson, arriving late for class owing to the mysterious disappearance of a pair of house shoes. Sorry I'm late, sir, he apologised breezily. You should have been here five minutes ago. Why, what happened, sir? Did I miss something? Doll! Oh! Mr Wilkins thumped the works of Alfred Lord Tennyson in exasperation. I meant you were late for my lesson. This is the fourth time I've tried to recite this poem without getting beyond the first few lines, and if I hear one more sound from this class, I'll... I'll... Well, there had better not be one more sound. It was becoming evident to Form 3 that the happy atmosphere so necessary for the presentation of farewell gifts was sadly lacking. They sat still as statues, determined that Mr Wilkins should have no further cause to complain. Ring out wild bells by Alfred Lord Tennyson, he announced dramatically. He cleared his throat again and began. <coughs> Ring out wild bells to the... W he got no further. For at that instant, the peaceful atmosphere was shattered by the ear-splitting, nerve-rending shrilling of an alarm clock bell from within the cupboard. It was a harsh, jarring scream of a noise, which in the quiet classroom sounded as loud as the whistle of a locomotive, the blare of a ship's siren, and the whine of a jet aircraft engine all rolled into one vast pandemonium of sound. Mr Wilkins leapt like a mountain goat. The volume of verse shot from his nerveless fingers and described a somersault in midair before landing face downwards on a desk in the front row. And all the time, the shrilling of the alarm bell went on and on and on. Form 3 sat numb with hopeless despair while their form master sought to regain control of his outraged feelings. At last he found his voice. I, 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 uh, uh, bro, uh, who's ringing out that wild bell? I mean, who's responsible for this disgraceful behaviour? The alarm ran down and the ringing ceased as Jennings raised his hand. It wasn't meant to go off then, sir. It was just a terrible accident. It was a special secret surprise that we were planning for you, sir. How dare you plan secret surprises in my lesson? I never heard of such a thing. Insolence, impudence, simp... Pertinence. Oh, no, sir. Oh, yes, sir. The very idea of letting off wild alarm bells in the middle of my wild sky, oh, my lesson. But, sir, you don't understand, sir. But Mr Wilkins was convinced that he did understand. Take that thing, whatever it is, out of the cupboard and bring it to me at once. Heavy in heart, Jennings obeyed. If only Mr Wilkins would listen. If only he would give them a chance to explain. But Mr Wilkins wouldn't listen. As the presentation clock was laid on the desk before him, he burst out angrily, how you have had the audacity, Jennings, to hide this thing in the cupboard and set it off in the middle of my lesson, I... Well, I don't know. Oh, but, sir, I didn't, sir. Quiet, boy. I shall confiscate this, this monstrous contraption, Mr Wilkins announced, placing the clock inside the master's desk. And furthermore, I shall report this form to the headmaster for insolent and impertinent behaviour. And now, we will proceed with the lesson. He glared at the rows of unhappy faces before him and then picked up his book of poems. Ring out wild bells to the wild sky, the flying cloud, the frosty light. His voice boomed on, but Form 3 were too stunned by the disaster to pay any attention to his words. Their hopes and plans, the happy atmosphere and the joy of giving, all these lay in ruins. How could it be otherwise?
when people were so tactless as to confiscate their own farewell gifts. <laughs>